Hi, um, welcome to Paranormal Versus um, with myself, Kel Ridley, and my co-host Michael Koff and special co-host Matt Atkinson. Um, we'll have a really interesting show tonight and we have Mark Sargent on the show who's a huge influence in the Flat Earth movement and I've been looking forward to this show for absolutely ages so that's why I've got a huge smile on my face tonight. But apart from that, just wanted to say hope everybody had a safe and brilliant Halloween and so we're going to introduce Mark and let him tell you a bit about yourself anyway. Go with you, Mark. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, na my name is Mark Sargent. I am an American. Obviously, I live over um, north of Seattle on the west coast of the United States. And I am officially a flat earth recruiter. I am not a king or president or duke or bishop or anything like that. Uh, all I did was I helped create uh, the metaphorical Flat Earth 101 doctrine back in 2015, put it out on the internet with all my contact information because that's exactly what you want to do when you're on the internet and let people call me and write me and, and get, you know, drive, drive up to the house and stuff. And uh, that started a, a snowball of things that eight years later, I never thought would have happened. Uh, three books, a Netflix documentary, uh, endorsements. I lost count of how many interviews. I lost count of how many uh, uh, meetups, definitely meetups and conferences. You know, before the pandemic, we had done conferences, I think, in what, seven or eight different countries, which was amazing. And I just got back from the, the big one in Las Vegas, Nevada, just last week where I opened and I helped MC and it was a lot of fun. And so, yeah, Flat Earth, that's what I do, 24-7. <laughs> so um, how old were you when you, you first um, started thinking that the Earth was flat? I was nine. No, I was not nine. I was uh, I was forty six. Uh, I was I was forty six and living in Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I I never mar got married or had kids for better or worse. And so I had a lot of free time on my hands. And I'm older, so I had a chance. I was there when the internet was brand new and followed the internet, you know, to where you could finish it. And then it exploded and went down a whole bunch of different rabbit holes. I have, I have an opinion on just about every conspiracy you can think of, probably even things you, you can't talk about here. Mm -hmm. And then in 2014, I started looking into Flat Earth because, well, I'm not getting any younger, so why the hell not? And nine months later, I'm just banging my head on the keyboard going, why can't I prove this? Why can't the globe? Why can't I prove the globe? Nobody gets into Flat Earth because they, they love Flat Earth. Nobody. <clears throat> everybody, everybody gets in because it's like, oh, I'll try to debunk it. That's one of the T-shirts. Yeah. And uh, February 2015, created Flat Earth Clues, which was the most amateur <laughs> video production, I think, ever. I, I didn't know how to e edit anything. I mean, I literally had to download, like, Windows Movie Maker Live and, like, just cobble this together and, and narrate it myself and, and write it. And, uh, yeah, so that's how I got into it. Wow. Wow. I've got a question for you as well, Mark. I don't think so. No question. Yeah. <laughs> we, I mean, I think most people that, that know about the Flat Earth that are watching this know the, the basic principle of what the Flat Earth right. could be. Um, do you think there could be other multiple worlds on this plane that we live on? Now, do the, I... the reason I say that, yeah, I mean, you've got people that, you know, there's people out there that believe in aliens and alien worlds and all that kind of stuff. Right. But if we go down the whole flat earth thing and think that, right, we're living on one huge plane. Right. Do you think there could be other worlds on the same plane that we're on? Oh, God, like, I hope so. We could hold alien, alien life, that kind of thing. Like yeah. Beyond yeah, yeah, yeah. the wall type of thing. Beyond the wall, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Why? In fact, why? If you're going to make one snow globe, and for those people that are listening that, that don't know what we're talking about, we're, we're talking about um, a, a world that's basically encapsulated, basically an enclosed world. I don't know what other what other comparison I could do other than snow globe. Other people have said like shallow sports stadium. Other people, I, I even had one person say like a pizza box. It's like okay, well I know where your audience is at. Yeah. So, um, but if it was if there was one snow globe, why wouldn't there be others? This is not a one off. And I, I'm a belie big believer not only in dualism but uh, the macro micro whole thing, which is if it 
from from my standpoint, it doesn't appear that we're even the first people to rent this apartment. Meaning, not only was this place built, but I don't think it was built just for us. You know, look at the the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, um, Bimini Road, the, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Machu Picchu, Puma Punku, and all the other places that ancient aliens uh, ever ever were at. I mean, those are civilizations that were there a long time before us. Our our broken history only goes back five thousand years. I bring that up because. If this, if we're not even a one-off inside of here, why would there be a one-off outside of here? I mean, if you're God, and I'm not mm. trying to disparage God in any way, or at least an advanced civilization much older and more powerful than ourselves, why wouldn't you have multiple worlds out here? And and, and I don't think that really conflicts with the whole I, ideology of you know people say oh you know like the Twilight Zone episode. So it's like oh there's people in Mars and Venus and Jupiter. It's like, well, it, it's like, well, I believe in other worlds, but I just don't think they're up there. I think they're just mm -hmm. on the same plane with us. So, yeah, sure. Why not? If you were God, why wouldn't you have a whole bunch of these things on a table somewhere in various uh, stages of development? And then makes it way more interesting. And I'll throw one more in that I would even have if it was me. Again, I'm not trying to say that I could you know, put myself in the mind of God, but I would even put a subcontractor. Uh, like a like a small G, you know, deity on on each one, which would be randomly developed mm. on, on each one. So make it even make it even more random. I'm a big believer that that novelty is one of the fuels of this universe, and and God needs it, like like we do. Mm. Anyway, yeah, so, I mean, ramble. Please pull me back if I go far too far off into the weeds. Michael, no. hey Michael, seriously, <laughs> settle down. You're just too much of a chatterbox right now. <laughs> I can't get a word in, but go ahead. Yeah, he's, he's just taking it all in. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so, then, uh, I'm watching chat groups and looking. Oh, for okay, questions. okay, okay. Then, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about you. <laughs> um, I mean, like as you call it, rambling. You can ramble as much as I like. We we'll like hearing this, so okay, go for it. <laughs> okay. Believe me, we ramble a lot, so you're in good company. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I, but I, 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 I get paid to ramble, <laughs> so it, <laughs> don't worry. I mean, I, I go off into the freaking weeds, and my mind is like a, like a bag of cats sometimes. So anyway, go yeah. ahead. Well, that's the most interesting people are usually like that anyway. So, mm. cool. <laughs> what's, what's your view, Mark, on these missing planes, like the MH, whatever it was, a few years ago? Oh, yeah. you, they, they still haven't found any wreckage for. Do you think no, 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 no. planes might have? Passed over the wall, and they're somewhere else now. Not a possibility. No, not over the wall, but they fell into one of the the, the dead zones, which is oh, yeah. uh, and for those of you who don't know what we're talking about here, um, the GPS system, which was announced by the United States military back in the nineties, it's it's a Department of Defense system, which basically says that there's 32 overlapping, I think it's 32, overlapping blanket coverage satellites that are surrounding the whole Earth and, and it can track anything. And I, I never, never thought that was real. Uh, you know, we, we like, the United States power perceived is power achieved. So I think it's the old Loran system, L-O-R-A-N, which is a ground-based radar system. They just slapped another sticker on it and, and then augmented it with cell phone towers wherever they could and then added some more radars on small islands. But what happens is, and I didn't even, there was a guy in UK that sent me the, the, the tip to that clue that I made in the original clues, which was when you get over the ocean and there isn't an island within 200 miles in any direction of you, your latitude and longitude blanks out. It goes into dashes, basically. It goes into approximated or estimated mode, which mm -hmm. means they know approximately where you are and they can kind of estimate where you're going to be. But if you fell into the ocean right in that point, they don't know. <laughs> they absolutely don't know for sure. Yeah. And it happens mostly in the Southern hemisphere. If you're looking on a globe, which is anywhere between uh, South America and Africa or Africa and Australia and places like that. Yeah. And now, luckily for us, there's lots of islands, but there are dead zones. In certain, especially in the South Pacific and, and the South Atlantic and even in the South Indian Ocean where uh, the, the MH flights went down. And, and of course, that really, you know, I'm, I'm up in an area where they, you know, the, the Boeing factory is only like 10 miles from here. Mm. 
mm. the, big, the big one. And it's like, look, th those were triple sevens, right? That's flagship, right? Those are that those are planes with huge amounts of redundancy. If those planes go down, there's a big, big problem. And I remember people coming to me even before those flights went down and they say, oh, yeah, the dead zones are just aren't in the southern hemisphere as well. I'll give you a great example. Um, I, again, I love the Internet hive mind. They miss nothing, which is they said uh, when you go from like California to Hawaii, if you, if you ever know anyone that takes that trip, there are no islands between California and Hawaii. None. So when you get off of the coast of California, you fall into a dead zone. And it's like, wow, it's amazing. We haven't lost. But again, it works out. Because all the plane has to do is keep its heading and speed, and eventually, once they get close to land, the, the 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 radar on the other end picks them up, and they're like, "Oh, okay." Then they make a slight course correction, and they're fine. Nobody oh. questions it. The, the pilots are like, oh, you know, the pilots have told me many, many times. It's like, yeah, for the most part, we just like you know getting from point A to point B without crashing. <laughs> all yeah. their observations just go out the window. We, you know, which is why. Most of them, you know, have never, ever noticed, you know, the fact that the headings look really, really weird, which we can talk about our emergency landings if you want. Uh, or, you know, most, pi most pilots are really scared about job security. They won't even, if a UFO even comes remotely, which they joked about in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which was, you know, the, that movie opened with like near misses to planes. And they asked the pilots, like, you want to make an official report? And like all of them, like, yeah, no, no, we're not doing an official report. Yeah. If you will go on record. You're on record, and people, the notable pilots over the years, have gotten fired just for even saying the word UFO. Wow. So yeah, you you say the word flat Earth, and you're a pilot. We there was a, a lady from KLM that uh, does stuff. Um, multiple people have interviewed her, where um, she believes she's one of ours, and she got benched. She didn't get fired, but she's not going on a plane anymore. Mm. Wow. So. Yeah. I've seen um, uh, things on like different social medias and that about um, a pilot. He actually got his camera out and started filming that the sun was actually below the horizon. Right. So things like that. Yeah, there's weird atmospheric anomalies that we can't even explain other than, and I don't want to get into this too much, uh, you know, depending on where you guys want to go, which is it for me, l let's cut to some of the chase here. If we are living in some sort of enclosed world and it's flat, it's probably virtual. Mm -hmm. And if it's virtual, well, then all bets are off because yes. anything optically can be done. I mean, a absolutely anything is possible. So if uh, there are glitches in the matrix, you know, the mm -hmm. whole black cat thing. Oh, yeah, sure. Why, why would they have them with just a stupid black cat? And they're going to happen with with everything you can think of. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you think we're living in a simulation? Do you think we are? Or I do. But the reason I don't play it up more is because the general population has a hard enough time with flat earth <laughs> meaning yeah. i have to take it down to the lowest common denominator i mean don't forget that the matrix right the matrix movie is 20 23 years old now 24 years old that's ridiculous wow. it's, that's a long time it's a generation and change yeah. ago and most people didn't get it right they understood it's like oh wow cool special effects look he dodged bullets but it's like you realize what we're talking about here right it was a virtual reality that he was in and he wasn't even and he was doing multiple multiple runs through it which they said at the end it's like oh yeah this is like the seventh time i've run, i've talked to you and they, which meant he he'd done this multiple times but two things uh, um i could i could spend the whole show on this but i'll i'll let me boil it down two things you should look at when trying to tie this thing to a virtual reality the first one would be uh the double slit experiment which i love so much uh it was a famous physics thing that eventually were refined refined and the double slit experiment says that um you know it's the whole you know the is the cat alive is it's dead is it dead wave versus particle but what it says is if you're not watching something over there it's not being fully rendered so you're looking at me but whatever's happening in the next room probably is nothing. There's nothing there. It's mm -hmm. just math. It's just math. It's just code, right? Mm -hmm. That hasn't been rendered yet because why would you draw it? And you say, okay, what does that got to do with anything? It's like, well, because when we started making virtual realities, we started doing that without even just naturally. So if, you know, if you've, I don't know if you guys ever play games, but if you know your character, if you see background stuff, like there's a mountain way off the distance, you know your character's never ever going to go there, right? Yeah. As a programmer, do you draw the other side of that mountain? Nope. 
Nope. Why would you? That's a waste of resources. Right. Why would you have somebody mm-hmm. even spend time doing that? You just draw the front side of the mountain. It's that's Hollywood 101, right? That's that's stagecraft where, you know, yeah. if you've ever been to a live stage play, you only show the front. You don't show the back. You know, the, the it's the Truman Show all over again. Yeah. yeah. So that's the first the other thing they like to do, too, is say, warning, you're leaving the play area boundaries. You right. have to turn back. Right. Absolutely. Or they'll throw in one of my favorites is negative physics, which is just freaky, which is if the warning, because you know, kids don't even, like, they'll just ignore it. It's like, oh, let's see how far I could go. It's like, your character will die. It's like, I don't care. They will, um, they'll throw up what's known as like a digital fog that, that you literally can't see the your hand in front of your face. You become so disoriented. You don't know where you are. And it's like, oh God, you, you got to get the hell out of there. Um, the other mm-hmm. thing but it also answers the, the question, which you may or may not have gotten as a child, which is if, uh, if a tree falls in the forest and you're not there to hear it, does it make a sound? Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like yeah. when I was a kid growing up, it's like, wow, it's just, I don't even know what to do with that. But now, and, you know, going through the, the video game industry, it's like, oh, no, <laughs> there's no tree. <laughs> Why would there be a tree? We didn't drive. The tree's not even there until you get there. And even then, you know, if you get there fast enough, you can actually see the tree being built. Then we'll cut it down. Hmm. Um, the other thing, look this up if you get a chance, which is even what you think that's wild. No, no. The wild stuff is um, there's a wiki page on it, which is really great, called Neuroscience and Free Will. If you guys have never heard of this, look it up. It goes into predestination, which okay. is um, what what it means. So there were some scientists hooked up, you know, as scientists do, you know, they set people down in front of a computer and and stick little electrodes on top of their head. And they say, okay, on your computer, pick a number between one and nine. There's going to be a, a stopwatch thing on, on the computer. And we're going to, we're going to register what's happening in your brain, right? So pick a number between one and nine. And then note if there's any gap, you know, if you have any indecision between the time you think of the number and the time you hit the key, right? Normally it's just a half of a second, you know, something like that. But sometimes every once in a while somebody has a change of heart and it's like, it's like, what? oh no, I meant to hit six, but I want to hit whatever. So when they did this, this is where it gets weird, right? So if you, if I say pick a number between one and nine, you say four, right? And hit four, right? The computer knew you were going to hit a number. It couldn't tell you what number. But it knew you were going to hit a number eight seconds ago mm. before it was even a conscious thought, meaning okay. it could see your head spinning up the, the, cho- the choice to move your hand to hit it eight seconds before you even thought about the number. You think, well, nothing, nothing's faster than, um, than human thought. It's like, mm. no, no. What it's saying is, is that you made the choice before you even walked into the room. Mm-hmm. And and that goes into you know, if you remember the Matrix movie uh, uh, where and again glo- people just blew by this one which was the the Oracle was talking to Neo and he's going I can't make the choice you know between Trinity and everybody else and she goes you're not here to make the choice you've already made it you're here to understand the choice why yeah. you made the choice which means that I'll give you one more analogy really fast which is. It is possible that you are living, you're not living in an interactive virtual reality. You're living in a pre-record, something where you made the choices ahead of time before you got here and then you blocked the memory. I'll give you a quick, because that saves even more resources. So if you ever know any kids or if you you do it yourself, I'm not going to blame you. I'm not judging all God's children. But if you've ever watched somebody play a video game on YouTube for an hour or so, right? They're just playing the game and you're watching it. Kids are notorious for that. Kids are so lazy now, they won't even play their own games. They watch other people play games. But what you don't realize is when they're doing this, they're getting almost the same experience as if they played it themselves, except yeah. that there's no network going on. There's no massive bank of servers. They're just watching a little MP4 file, a little tiny movie, and they're getting almost the same experience. I know this because I've done this every once in a while just to watch. I'll watch. I'll, I will catch myself reaching for the mouse. Even though, you know, even though I'm not playing the game, it's like, oh, God, what am I doing? It's like, so anyway, there you go. Neuroscience and free will. Look it up. Predestination. Mm. I believe mm. it. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. i got another question for you, Mark. Flat uh, Earth. What? <laughs> what? Right. OK. Let, let's say the Earth is flat. Sure. Why is there such a conspiracy to hide the fact that? You know, it's flat. Why, why are they telling? Why are the powers that be telling everyone that? Yeah, we live on a globe. You know this. Yeah, no, no, I got it. Why the, the big. Why? Why would, why would you? 
Yeah, the, yeah. it's going to sound this is going to sound like a terrible answer when I first say it, but you'll get it, which is the reason why they, they kept it a secret is bad timing, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, we didn't even have if you if you know anything about our history and our tech, we basically didn't have any decent tech until about 100 years ago. And I mean, come on, we didn't have even the, the earliest con, um, uh, internal combustion engines are what, 100 years old, barely. Yeah. And then uh, pressurized aircraft, not even not even half a century, really, for, for the good stuff. Jets, you know, we, we just, you know, started working on those in, what, the late 50s, early 60s, you know, imitating the Germans. So we didn't even have the technology to find out what this world was until almost 1960. Hmm. At that point, let's say you're sitting at an Illuminati meeting, right? You know, big, long table, hardly any lights, everybody's smoking for some reason. Yeah. And... You're, you're, you're saying to yourself, you know, what could go wrong, right? What, what could go wrong? You know, remember, it's 1960. Civilization has already been established. Everything's been laid out. Uh, three things would happen really, really big. First would be academically, uh, all universities would have to empty out libraries and put stuff back in because anything with an ology tied to it would have to be rewritten with a, with a new model in mind. Um, and astronomy and astrophysics, I don't know how they even come back. And then uh, the world markets, economically, world markets have to be suspended for a long time because you don't know what it means in the long term. But the big thing is the, the five major religious houses, which would be um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. You're giving them all leverage simultaneously against science, who has built up their foundation for at least five centuries. And you're telling them to show restraint. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer for, for that meeting. <laughs> Somebody at the end of the table, it's like... So, yeah, we're putting a pin in this. <sighs> Nobody tell anybody anything. I don't know why it sounded like I was smoking a joint, but you kind of get, <laughs> you, you get my point. They, they, they couldn't. They, the, I, look, I, I don't blame them. I wouldn't tell the population either. You got to remember that just, um, what, 13 years earlier, um, 47, you had Roswell. And that was over here. And Roswell freaked people out, right? <laughs> You know, that went to, and there was there was no television in 47 over here. It was just radio and newspapers. And the they were the media, the limited media we had was just losing their minds. It's like flying saucers, oh my god, to where they had to walk it back. And it's like, no, no, weather balloon, weather balloon, everybody pictures, weather balloon, it's fine, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And then then you bury everything and move it out to a, a new base in the in the desert. So no, no, you, you can't, it's not, it's not what they stand to gain, it's what they stand to lose. And come on, information is power. It's the, it's the most powerful currency there is. And it is, a, it is a short meeting to where you say, look, we can't tell anybody until we can figure out how we can use it to our advantage and keep people from losing it. Just, you know, freaking, because it would, it would change everything. It would absolutely mm -hmm. change uh, everything in the long term uh, because you're yeah. showing, you're showing people, sorry, I don't want to drag this out. You're showing people the fence, meaning uh, something I talked about in the clues, which is, um, I don't know, do you guys have wildlife preserves out there? Where there's like yeah we have like zoos that kind of thing yeah yeah, 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 yeah but you don't have uh, you have limit we have big tracts of land here where we say we fence it off and we say okay buffalo you can do whatever you want in there and people aren't allowed to build in there we have a lot of land that way you could put you know uh, 500 buffalo in a thousand acre wildlife preserve they're not going to care and like Pff, I got water I got food they walk up to the fence do not care it's like turn around. You put a dozen people in that same wildlife preserve, people, all they're going to care about is the fence. It's mm. all they care about. If no one likes to be fed. It's like, what's the fence there for? Why are we on this side? What's on the other side? Who built the fence? Are they gods? Did we anger the fence people? We should sacrifice things to the fence gods. It's like, get some of those buffalo. And then the whole thing starts over. I mean, it's it's so... Where was I going with this? <laughs> oh, Anyway, you, you kind of get it, right? Yeah. You uh -huh. can't you can't tell people this. Well, you, not until recently, and now we've been. Pro I think we've gone as far as we can go, and so that's why they're kind of letting it out. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, when you were talking about um UFOs and that before, um, where do you think they would come from then? Oh yeah. Well, for me, uh, again, I let me preface this with: I was watching UFOs for a long time. You want to see UFOs? You can see UFOs. Any day you want. All you have to do is grab some uh, night vision binoculars. That's it. Mm -hmm. 
five, five power or higher. Mm-hmm. I think you can buy them on, on Amazon for like a hundred, hundred pounds, give or take. They used to be the really tough to find, but now you can get them, you can get them cheap. And mm-hmm. somebody told me this, uh, in fact, it was a British guy. They, he, he, um, he said, you want to see some weird stuff, get some night vision, start going out at night and looking up there. Right. I'm going, okay. So I go out there and the first night I'm going, and it, it is, you, you, you think that the sky is just crawling with satellites. And they're up there, way up there, most of them. It's like, wow, this is really cool and really boring at the same time. I don't want to keep doing this. And then you follow a couple of them. And all of a sudden, I I remember one specifically. I was in Colorado. And it just slowed down and just stopped. Like, it was lost. And it's like, and then, like, it was like like looking up a map. (laughs) And then hit a hard left and went ballistic at an amazing rate of speed. I'm going, what the hell did I just watch? And that would happen over and over and over again. So... But to, to answer your question, do I think they're from Mars and Jupiter and Venus? No, I just think they're older versions of us right. um, with, with better tech. You know, our tech is limited and they will never let us have flying cars. This, this, our, this particular civilization is never going to be allowed that. Because if you had flying cars, you know, like the, the UFOs, that's what, really what a yeah. UFO is. It's a flying freaking car. Um, you'd find out what this place was really, really fast. And Mm -hmm. so I think that every civilization has their time here. And then kind of like a graduating class, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And we don't encourage you to come back here either. You know, you you go out and do your own life. And so every civilization, once they, once they graduate, graduate, they, um, they're, you know, they either go subterranean, they go interdimensional, who knows, maybe they're allowed access to one of the other snow globes. I wouldn't, if it was me, there's plenty of room here for subterranean civilizations. Hmm. and um and again they're told that i think there's rules though again look you guys want to look up some weird the the greatest ufo sighting which nobody knows about uh which i've been preaching for years is the 1561 nuremberg event there's a wiki page on it it's brilliant which Hmm. is which was a complete violation of the rules star trek prime directive applies here you cannot show up in a golden spaceship and land in london and start taking selfies and signing out autographs you can't it would change way too many things, but the 1561 Nuremberg event, thank God, you, you couldn't. It couldn't even happen today. Was was that? So on a, on a beautiful, cloudless morning, Nuremberg, Germany, in April, 1561, two giant, what can only be described as flying aircraft carriers, showed up from either side and just started hammering on each other over the city for a full hour, right? And to where again, there's no photography back in 1561, but you know, sketch artists, that was a thing. So guys came, I mean, an hour, that's a long time. They're drawing everything. The, 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 the visuals are gorgeous. Mm. And, um, you know, I mean, it, during breakfast, people are having their toast and schnitzengluben or whatever they have. And <laughs> like at the end, they have these wonderful sketches. And then a third sh- faction shows up, a singular black pointy craft. And the thing looked like a, like basically like a flying weapon. <laughs> and it flew in between them. Those two take off, and then this thing hangs out for a little bit, and this takes off on its own. Wow. That raised so many questions for me. It's like, what sort of hierarchy are we looking at here? First is, who are these first, first two factions, right? They must have found some sort of uncovered zone where nobody was, was watching, so they're fighting over the city. Who was the third faction? Were they the UN? Were they the cops? What, what the hell? And my, my final one on that is, what sort of response time is an hour? Right, I could shoot a gun out this window right here. There's going to be cops in under ten minutes, <laughs> you know, armed SWAT teams. But an hour you're doing a full military engagement over a city, and an hour later, then somebody shows up. It's just mind blowing to me. Wow. Anyway, there you go. Hmm. I've actually I remember that one now. I think I've seen pictures of that one. Oh, the drawings are gorgeous. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. You can look it up on Wiki. It's um absolutely freaking gorgeous. Uh, yeah. and it, there was even like one of the factions, you know, had had crashes in parts of the city. It's like, oh man, if I could go back into time, I would love, you know, because that wreckage was either picked up by the faction themselves or, you know, buried. And they didn't remember science fiction didn't exist back then. Yeah. So they thought it was a religious event. Mm-hmm. You know, why wouldn't you? You know, it's like, why are the angels fighting? What's happening? It's like, no. It's, and and they were, you know, two distinct factions. One had um like wings, they're like X, you know, call it X wings if you want. But they did, the, and the others were like saucer or spherical in nature. Just fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
Okay, here's one for you, Mark. I mean, everyone watching this knows that you're the face of the flat earth community, the advocate for the flat earth. Sometimes. What you, yeah. What are your views on the whole hollow earth conspiracy as well? Hollow no, no, earth. It, it kind of goes against the grain of what you're into. But if you no, it, no, no, no. I was a huge, well, okay. Back when I was doing the, you know, I was going through every conspiracy I could think of um, in the early 2000s, I got into hollow earth believe it or not. And, and in the mid, mid 2000s, I got into Nibiru as a whole nother nightmare. But um, <laughs> Hollow Earth took on a whole different tone for me because when I got into Flat Earth, I realized what was possible with engineering a Hollow Earth. Meaning when hollow people think of Hollow Earth, they think of like Admiral Byrd's story, you know, Journey to the Ascent of the Earth. And they think of like Star Trek, a Dyson sphere where, you know, where the whole, whole, the whole core of the Earth is just this giant open space mm -hmm. and people forget that the bulk of our population lives between sea level and a mile up right five thousand seven thousand yeah. meters give or take that's 95 percent of our population because altitude kick the sickness ki kicks in at about um so how many meters seven thousand feet so whatever that is in meters and <clears throat> If that's the case, and, and commercial airlines um, cap out at 10 miles up, spy planes, if you believe them, at 20 miles up. So if that's the case, you don't need much of a hollowed out earth. You know, you could, you know, a cave, even if it was a cave which was 50 miles high by 800 miles long or 400 miles long, that's more than any city we've got. That's way more. I mean, you could absolutely have full blown. In fact, at that point, you're saying, well, who's to say we aren't in a hollow earth? And then what, what we're looking at, you know, is, is in some sort of projection on, you know, the, some sort of vault on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I, I love Hollow Earth. I still think it's absolutely feasible. And it fits in with the previous civilizations, which is that previous civilizations can do just fine with some sort of basement apartment type situation. Yeah, I mean, come on. That's what the military does with, with deep underground bases all the time. Mm -hmm. So why, why wouldn't another civilization be perfectly happy? You can make wonderful accommodations subterranean and then again follow the rules you can come up on the surface you want to pick off some drunk guys in a rowboat or some campers or something like that you know isolated people that aren't going to believe you know the the stories are going to be completely not credible um and you know the fact they did a simpsons episode on it a long time ago but you can't do anything in mass you can't land in the middle of dublin <laughs> not gonna happen no you're not gonna happen you you can't you can't break those sort of rules and i get it i get it the prime directive I know it's a television show, but come on, it makes sense. It works. Hmm. Cool. Um, Michael, have you got any questions? I'm still taking all this in. And <laughs> actually, though, I do oh, here have we go. Yeah, here we go. one question. <laughs> yes. So you, it's sort of a flat earth, but it's... More hey, Michael, on the Michael, where side. are you, by the way? I don't, I don't detect a hint of accent. Where are you? I'm actually in Texas. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I hide my accent. I, I do better at hiding it than Kel. <laughs> I, I can bring my accent out with soda. <laughs> Are you originally from Texas? No, I'm originally from Chicago. Oh, all right. All right. Didn't wouldn't have picked that up. <laughs> Like I said, I can hide my accent well. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but so Bigfoot, I, I've seen that Bigfoot. you're into Bigfoot and everything. So oh. are you of the mind that Bigfoot is living on the inner earth or another dimension or is here? We just don't see him. All right. The, the, okay. First off, and I don't care what I did not write my own wiki page. I don't write any of my own social media stuff at all. People just do it for me and I don't try to correct it. It's like, hey, you want to spread weird rumors? Go ahead. Um, when it comes to Bigfoot, uh, there's three things I can mention. First off, uh, I if you play games at all, I consider them the equivalent of treasure goblins, which is uncatchable, mythical things. That, do I think they're real? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I really do, but I think they are way, they have access to way more special abilities than, than we do. I'll give you a great example. There was a rancher. I don't know if he was in Texas. I don't think he was. I think he was up like in Montana or Idaho or somewhere. 
I remember the story of uh, this rancher that, that had a lever action rifle. He was on horseback. He was right in the edge of the woods and he had a Bigfoot dead to rights right in front of him. I mean, point from horseback, basically point blank range. And by the time he raised his rifle and fired, it had blinked out. Didn't run, didn't, didn't fall into the earth. It just vanished. Wow. And I call, you know, I, I like to call them uh, interdimensional hippie, basically. <laughs> long hair, long hair. They smell terrible. Uh, all the animals don't like to deal with them at all. Uh, and no one can catch them. I mean, come on. Even I'm a big believer in stats. And uh, come on, law of averages says we should have found a dead one by now, right? Mm-hmm. However, I land with this. The you want to look up something, look up what's known as the Billy Ape, B I L L Y. It is a chimpanzee, six feet tall. And if I'm not mistaken, we didn't even find the damn thing until 2015. And in fact, you know what? I'll, I'll since you talked about Bigfoot, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll go the other side of the pond. I'll do the Loch Ness monster after this because I love that one. So anyway, the the Billy Ape. The the reason why we couldn't get them is they were really wary of people. They avoided. They were really good climbers, really fast. And they, if they saw a human being anywhere close, they're like gone. They, they're gone. Never ever can catch them. The only reason we even knew is because a dead one. Finally, you know, some archaeologist in a village somewhere, the, the villagers were, you know, kind of looking at it. They, they dragged it back to camp. And I'll be damned if it wasn't. I mean, it was absolutely authentic. And you can look it up. It's a, it's a six foot tall chimp. But we didn't even figure it out until 2015. So if you had some sort of primate that was really wary of humans, strong, fast, you know, it, who knows? Maybe they carry off their dead. I mean, ants do. So why wouldn't these things, you know, is it possible? Sure. Um, I, I don't think it's fair that, you know, over in the States, we offered like a million dollar reward to hunters that could bag one of these things. And by that, you have to get the head because these things weigh like 400 pounds, supposedly. But I'm curious about them. But let me let me talk about Loch Ness really quick, because we, we might as well jump there, which is people will say, do you think the, the Loch Ness monster is real? I go, yeah, I do. You want to know why? I go, the coelacanth fish. That's why. Look up the C O E L C A N T H, coelacanth fish. Uh, you can click on images. It's a really ugly fish with a whole bunch of extra fins that's been extinct for 70 million years, right? Mm-hmm. We, we know this because we got the fossil records and the carbon dating. You know, it's oh, well, we carbon dated this in 70 million years. Carbon dating, by the way, is absolute sham, absolute freaking joke. You know, they, they've carbon dated people, <laughs> you know, like living, walking people around at 10,000 years. So anyway, the coelacanth fish was, was, was extinct. Well, there's a problem because the British Navy found one off the coast of South Africa in um, 1938. There's a wonderful shot of it. And of course, they send the, the, the photographs you know, to, back to, to London and you know, all the scientists are like, no, it's preposterous. No. You know, there's no way. Complete denial. And then they catch another one off of Mozambique, another one off of, off of Madagascar. And then they finally figure out, oh, hey, they're all over Africa. They're swimming all around Africa. And in fact, National Geographic did a special on them years ago. Yeah. What's the point? The point is this. You, they, the, the, and again, it took them a long time. In fact, scientists had to backpedal. They say, well, it's a it's a living fossil. They had to make up terms. It's a living fossil. It's, it's an evolutionary state of stasis, right? So then I come back and I, I say, is the Loch Ness Monster real? And whoever is on the other side says, well, no. I go, why? Because, well, because it's been extinct for, you know, like 100 million years. Oh, oh, you mean like that fish over there? That fish, <laughs> right? Which is absolutely alive and swimming, right? And and then I, I don't mean to poke at scientists, but I, I say, okay, so you were straight up dead wrong on that. Every scientist in the world would have lost money on this. And they did, right? Everyone, everyone lost face on this. That one you're wrong on. But the Loch Ness Monster, oh, you're, you're solid on that. Right, that there's no plesiosaur, no no aquatic reptiles of any kind survived the cataclysm that killed the reptiles. Right, even though that makes absolute sense. Mm-hmm. Right, we don't see pterodactyls flying around, we don't see T Rexes walking around, but in lakes and locks and all that, we see those things all the time. Mm-hmm. And, and they're also really smart. They see people are like, nope, <laughs> things they, they don't want nothing to do with us. So is Nessie real? You bet he is. And wh- wh- whatever children he has, drain the lake. You'll find it. 
I'm just laughing at you saying there's no pterodactyls. We actually have got a friend that's seen one. Not right, right, yeah. Michael. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me backpedal. There are the occasional people that say they've seen pterodactyls. If that is true, absolutely wild and amazing and wonderful. But again, law of averages, the 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 ocean stuff. Come on, we've got ocean stuff that that um uh, there's something called cryptozoology, which yeah. I love I love the term, which is anything that isn't dissected on a on a scientist table is a myth, right? You know, the giant panda, a myth. Giant anaconda, a myth. The giant squid, which they still have never gotten a full size. You're never going to catch one of those things. <laughs> They're freaking ridiculous. They're the uh, 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 they eat great whites. People, we yeah. only figured that out in, in the last ten years. Wow. Right, super super fast. So again, until it shows up in their lab, they and I don't blame them. I mean, the giant panda, it seemed ridiculous as a concept, right? Oh, this giant cuddly black and white bear that rolls on its back a lot and eats bamboo and doesn't really do much. That's a thing? No, it can't be. Yeah, it was. Sorry. Go ahead. Mm, we've got another question coming, haven't we? Um. <laughs> Matt is asking, how does Mark explain space and the universe on a flat Earth? Well, we can go there. Sure. Space is not what you think it is. Uh, meaning... You are in a giant planetarium, and I know that dates me because people don't. I don't even. Do you guys have planetariums over in England? Yeah, yeah, we oh, do. Oh, good. Oh, good. Over, there's, over there's here, one, I believe, in London, Matt, near Matt and Tussauds. Like one. <laughs> yeah. We one. we we would in the states we would have planetariums to where we'd educate kids in the weekdays and on the weekends we do like laser shows and people get completely baked. Right. And they were they wouldn't even hide it. It's like, oh, hey, we're gonna do Laser Floyd on Saturday. It's like, oh, great. So if if you're in a planetarium, then everything on the ceiling, everything on the ceiling is just a projection. Uh, it, it, for, in fact, for me, it's, it's much easier than that. It is everything you see in the sky is just part of a giant ornamental clock system that predates language. That's that's all it is. Uh, it is an illusion that we bought into deliberately. You know, it, it, that was part that was part of it. And I'm not saying that God is lazy. I'm saying that God is got is very, very efficient. If 99.99% of people believe what they see, you know, on the ceiling, you know, as real, then that's what you go with. In fact, even Carl Sagan said a number of times, he's going, you know, the universe doesn't make a lot of sense in that it is so huge and so empty. Mm. Yeah, it's not, we go the other way. It's like, it's like, it's not huge and it's not empty at all. It's just lights on a freaking ceiling. Uh, but let me, let me throw one more in there, which is. Um, so who made it then? Who, who, who built it? Who built the lights on the ceiling? Who built oh, the Elon Musk. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I, and, and by the way, if he takes credit for it one day, it would not surprise me because he takes credit <laughs> for everything. I don't hate a lot of people. I hate him as a media creation. That's uh, like, really? You're going to actually try to pawn him off as a poor man's Tony Stark? Really? That's what mm -hmm. you're going to do? He's Iron Man. Really? Yeah. Bunch of crap. So, no, who built it? Oh, sorry, one more thing real quick the, to the guy with the question, um, which was, think of this. And do you guys have Amish people over there, or is it just here? No, it's only in America. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah that's it's America. Here, right? So well, Amish, they may call them Quakers. Oh, Quakers? So people yeah. that – communities that re – Maybe – a community that rejects all technology. They they make their own clothes. They drive wagons with horses. Mm -hmm. um, we have those over here where people are they're, they're basically living – the lives from the the mid 1800s right they don't they don't do western medicine or anything like that imagine taking an amish person blindfolding them taking him to a planetarium pulling that blindfold off and watch what happens to his face oh. he will freak the hell out that ties back into and and again wow. that's just that's just a building right that's one of our buildings so to your question like who built it first off not us we had nothing with the with the building of this place um i'm i'm stealing that line straight out of um the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, which I was one of the greatest lines because it was so humble at the end where, where the aliens are like, yeah, we didn't build it. We don't know who did, <laughs> but we're just using it, right? So whoever built this place, you can really only go down one of two paths, right? It's either an um, um, older civilization more powerful than ourselves or a deity. But really, you're kind of splitting hairs there, aren't you? Because if a golden spaceship landed in the middle of London right now, two things would happen. One would be all the nerds that would show up and be like, wow, they look like the blue people from Avatar. You know, you know let's, let's get some selfies, right? 
And the other group would be like, we must worship the blue people. <laughs> it's like start building churches immediately, right? That's that's how it would go. So um, even even if God if God decides to show up one day, boy, it better be splashy, because if it is not if it is not a, like a you know a big song and dance number in Act Three, you're gonna get critics, which is sad. I hate to say it, but you know the internet trolls are still you know can you imagine that trolling God whatever so so anyway for me um i think uh it is um i i think it's a deity sure i do do i think it's capital g or do i think it's a small g i think it's small g that that i think i think capital g has a lot bigger things to worry about i think small g's you know fragments of him in in different different aspects and do things and that kind of makes sense for me come on if you follow the bible at all didn't the old testament kind of read like a temper tantrum in a lot of ways, you know, kid in a sandbox, you know, just wrecking things, you know, by the way, you know, not, not accidentally, you know, the holding a dinosaur in each hand, you know, rawr, crash, 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 crash. And then, you know, it gets builder, you know, better with time. Hopefully I don't get struck down for all what I just said there. Anyway, go on. What else you got? Well, to piggyback on what you're saying, Mark, it's kind of like talking about matrix where the Oracle was saying, you know, we have programs that want monitor programs, and there's a program for the birds. There's a program for yes. the oh, lights. oh, 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 oh! Let me, let me, let me expand on that really quick. That's such a great line. I'm glad you brought that up. That 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 line was not lost on me in the Matrix. He like, you see those birds? A specific program, right? You know, I had to, you know, to 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 govern them. There's a wonderful, you want to look up something cool. It ties into the virtual reality aspect of it, which is called the hundredth monkey effect. Love the hundredth monkey. Effect. I love, I love stuff that science discovers and then backpedals from because they regret discovering it. It's like, we didn't do it. So what we did was, because why, why wouldn't we? We, we were throwing potatoes to monkeys on islands outside of Japan. And some of the monkeys were realizing that, Hey, you know, if you wash the potatoes off in the water, you don't have to eat sand, right? It, it kind of makes sense. And so slowly but surely, more of these monkeys started learning from the other monkeys, right? They're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You get this, you know, water, no sand, good potato. Then something weird happened. When they hit about the hundredth monkey, and we don't know exactly, but sure, why not? It's a nice round number. When they hit the hundredth monkey, all the monkeys knew it simultaneously. They all learned it not just the ones on the beach but the ones on the other side of the island and the ones on islands that weren't even connected to those islands they all knew immediately it was an update a hot fix a beneficial update that what what we we do in software all the time which is it made sense it's like hey the monkey seemed to get more of this potato sand thing let's do a beneficial update hot fix roll it out now and once that happened, you know, and of course now, you know, science like, no, no, it's a myth. It absolutely did not happen. It's like, of course it did. We, what, we pulled that out of our ass? You guys are the ones that figured it out. So, yeah, yeah. Programs that, program for everything. The little things, the big things. I mean, come on, how many little things in nature do we have to observe? We, you know, you start, you start seeing the patterns. You stare at anything long enough, you start to you figure out the patterns. And that was one of them for me. I, I could imagine if I was a program like in charge of grass, yeah. I would want to commit suicide. <laughs> my job is to sit there and watch grass grow. Well, I mean, so it, small. It's like, really, this is all I'm going to do for the rest of my life. No, is no, 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 no. It, tiny you, growth. <laughs> you, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. If indeed, and I am not a big believer in set. I mean, the matrix, of course, you know, embellished on it, which is sentient, you know, self-aware. Um, I am, am <clears throat> when, they, when they talked about, in fact, AI, the whole term AI and, and that crap has been coming out over the last year. It's just ridiculous for me. Cause look, I used to program, not great, but I used to program back in the day. And I had geek friends that programmed, you know, we, we, we were in that biz, right? We loved, you know, everything that was programming and everything that was tech. And when it, we, I remember discussions we had, with, which was AI true self-aware or I could now sure chat GPT and all that crap. Can you do stuff that's, that's automated, right? Sure. You know, but will my little Roomba vacuum cleaner over there all of a sudden walk up to me one day 
you know, roll up to me and start questioning the meaning of life. No, no, it absolutely will not. Um, and that is because we can't even figure out, and again, I'm telling this from a software person, any software person wants to challenge it, please, please do. Um, we can't even figure out the flow chart for how to create self-awareness. The closest you could ever get, and I, I highly recommend that if you've never seen the movie, um, The Imitation Game, it'll with star, starring uh, Benedict uh, Cumberbatch, right? Right. Where, in fact, it was weird because the, the title of the, the, the movie was wrong in that, it, you know, it was about Alan Turing, the basically the grandfather of computers. And he came up with, he knew when, you know, because he created the, the first computer during World War II, then it was all classified because it was British intelligence. So he came up with what, what is now the imitation game, was, that's what he called it, was now called the Turing test. He called the imitation game because he realized the closest we could get to actual self-awareness, you know, like making a robot that'll start pondering the meaning of life, um, is an imitation of it, imitation of ourselves. So, yeah, you could program all sorts of wonderful dialogue things, and it can say it, but does it mean it? So, which is why he came up with, which is now known as the Turing test, which is um, um, questions that you ask computers to trip them up. To, into, you know, if you're not sure you're talking to a computer, there's a series of questions. They're, they're not made in stone. They've evolved over time. You ask them questions, and it'll trip you up. In fact, there's... um. Forget about the the movie. Was it Das Mechina? There was a one of the British version called um, starring Toby Stevens called The Machine. Look that up if you get a chance. The whole movie the, the movie opens with him asking a blindfold, you know, like a like a Siri, like a female voice on the other end, asking it questions to trip it up. He knows he's going to be able to trip it up, but how it responds is is he was his benchmark. How close we got to AI, true AI. Uh, do I think we'll truly hit self aware? No. No, no. We, we can get close. We can we can get to where it can fool you with a, again an imitation, but we can't. Hell, we can't even get the the voice right. Don't forget the movie. Um, her, you know, they use Scarlett Johansson as the um, as the voice because we, you know, you can talk to Siri all day long. Siri's not fooling you, right? Siri's not gonna, you know, no one's dating Siri or a version of Siri. Sorry, no. uh, again, off into the weeds. <laughs> what else you got? Mm, let me go well, let's have a look. Let's go through our list of questions here. I think we've touched on quite a few of them. So okay, this, I'm this kind is... of curious, Mark. Uh, I don't think so. What? With <laughs> everyone who's like, we when we see photos from the shuttles and we see photos from everything, how is it if the Earth is flat, do all of the photos have the sphere? Because, and I and I'm, I I will try to be as gentle as I can for for you, because NASA is theater. Shakespeare, all the world's a stage. NASA has been pure theater since since minute one. And I don't. And here's here's the part which you won't hear from a lot of people in my ranks, which was I don't blame them for doing it. Meaning they announced in 1959, you know, they they created NASA. In 1959, they also announced the Van Allen radiation belts which simultaneously, and, and, and 1959 created, um, I'm sorry, NASA was 58, 59 Van Allen ra radiation belts, and also 59, they, they created the, the Antarctic Treaty, which sealed off the upper edge and the outer edge. You want to look at NASA. Again, that's what, how everybody starts, which is they lean on NASA. Well, the space program, uh, you know, that, that has to show us, you know, it's got to be real. And so, uh oh dog, look out. So, <laughs> um, those were mine <laughs> so so i i in fact i'll i'll throw this at at the at the, the uk people over here which is because you're you're in texas michael which is i here, here's two quick things which is in the united states we believe in the space program because raw you know i think i, I think i even have a little american flag here rah rah you know wave the flag right that's that's what we do america's great wonderful so, in fact, Dana Perino, you watch Fox News ever? Uh, I used to, but okay. I know who she is. Dana Perino, great. She was a press secretary for uh, the Bushes before she got on Fox as, a, as one of the anchors. And she said, because they were talking about the, the space program and how you know people were saying it was fake. And she goes, I believe in the Apollo program because I'm a patriot. 
she said that straight to the camera and i got chills because i'm going okay i see what's happening here basically she's saying whatever the government says that's what's good for you right that don't do what we say right it doesn't matter <laughs> what it is that's you know we it's not that we're gonna lie to you we're probably lying to you for a good reason is what she was basically saying um, when I ask people outside the United States why they believe in the space program, in fact, I, I did a thing in Sweden a couple of years ago, and I asked the audience, I go, hey, why do you believe the Americans went to the moon? You know what the answer was? Because it was on television. And the American media would never lie about something like that. <laughs> and I, I, I could only keep a straight face for like five seconds. And yeah. I, was, I was going, guys, you don't know us at all. <laughs> we lie about absolutely everything. But to your, to your point, Michael, I'll give you three quick things. Um, we we'll, we'll, won't even talk about the ISS right away. Uh, we'll just say the Apollo program. You could you could go online and, and look up all sorts of Apollo images. Um, the first thing, they did not age well, and that's because when you hire photographers to shoot actual things, they embellish. They use studio techniques. Uh, Mark Twain's quote, which I love so much, which is, never let the truth get in the way of a good story or a good image for that matter, which is if we, when we lie, it's, we're lying because it's a better presentation, right? People, people, on, we, we've all done it to a certain point. You embellish on the story. So when they were shooting the lighting for, and, and setting up the, the moon photographs on the moon, right? For, perfect four inches of ash everywhere. There were three things, but forget about the, the stars that weren't in the background. I don't even care. You want to say it's exposure settings, fine. Saying exposure settings, don't care. I don't need it. Um, the one light source, there should be one light source, but camera guys hate using one light, one, one light source. So they brought in multiple, which meant the shadows were going in different directions, which cannot happen if the sun is 93 million miles away. And it's your only light source. Um, second one would be the, um, uh, uh, the, the blast crater, right? They just set this thing down on perfect four inches of ash and it's a 10,000 foot pounds of thrust engine. And yet there is no splay pattern. There's no blast crater at all. There should be no ash underneath that craft. And there wasn't a speck of dust moved out of place. But mm -hmm. even if you can get past those two or the feats of strength, which they should have had because you, you should be six times stronger on the moon, which they didn't want to talk about. Um, my favorite is the spacesuit, which is the spacesuit is basically just a deflated balloon that you get into. And if you're in a vacuum chamber, everybody knows when you're in a vacuum chamber, everything in a vacuum chamber ex expands if it's loose to the point where it bursts. Uh, you can put a soda can in a, in a vacuum chamber, a football, um, anything in a vacuum chamber. It will explode. The only object that's never ever th that's ever happened to is the spacesuit. Why? And I, and I knew exactly as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, my God, it is that is brilliant. Again, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, which is somebody at NASA or whatever the think tanks came up with this great idea. It's like, cause the early spacesuits were just plastic and metal and they look like B movie. They were horrible, but it's like, you have to be that way. Cause you're in a vacuum chamber, right? You can't put a soft suit. Soft suit would just blow up like a balloon. He tip over and he die. Right. And somebody came up with the idea. It's like, no, no, we'll just use the soft suit. We're not in a vacuum. We'll just put it on television. People will believe it. People will buy it. It's like, why? Cause it's on television. And in America, I don't know what it's like over there in America. The physics club and the math club in any education system are tiny compared to every other club. Band, really, really big. Physics club, really, really small and nerds that you want to beat up on a regular basis anyway. Right. So the nerds just justified. It's like, oh, they must have figured it out somehow. And that's they just left it. It's like, well, there it is. You know, the spacesuit works. And in fact, that was the challenge I put out to people years ago. I said, um, you want me, you know, you want me to convince me that the world isn't what I what I think it is fine. Loan me a university vacuum chamber. Loan me one of those spacesuits because they all worked. They were all flawless. Nobody's died in a spacesuit, you know, mm -hmm. because of a spacesuit accident. Put me in the vacuum chamber. Crank the lever. Tell me what happens. Tell me how I live. No one will touch that. No one will put me in a vacuum chamber because you can't fake a vacuum chamber. It cannot be faked. Um, well, if you know what you're doing, it cannot be faked. I mean, tap water boils in a vacuum chamber. A bell doesn't make a sound in a vacuum chamber. I could prove that it's a vacuum chamber or not with like $4 worth of materials. 10 if I buy a really nice bell. Anyway, there you go. So, so sorry, short answer, Michael, absolutely fake from, from beginning to end. Absolutely fake. And there's nothing. And again, why wouldn't it be? It's the, it's the U S military most of the time. Also, if you're talking about the moon and the faking of the moon landings and that, it's like when the, um, when the shuttle went back up 
and it's like who filmed it? Did they just leave somebody there to film it? And when the oh, motion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, they will, they will say that it was remote controlled, and they got they've said this in different things where they just got lucky. It's like okay, the the capsule lips off and it tilts perfectly. To, mm. to, to follow it up and they say oh they did that remote control it's like yeah but you have this huge delay right and you don't know exactly when that thing's firing off and yeah. it's like oh well we just got we just got lucky with the timing it's like no you didn't yeah. <laughs> you completely did not get lucky oh i'm sorry sorry one more thing real quick which is the transmitter you you you'll look and there's this wonderful old school vhf transmitter that's, that's supposedly shooting you know beaming back to earth it's like what's what's powering this thing anyone knows anything about transmission it's like look that thing's running off a car battery Right, and this is VHF technology from the 1960s. Right, that thing maybe has a 50 mile range with with Morse code, and yet that thing's cranking out 10 frames of color video a second and perfect two way communication. Mm. No, no, no. It, we did not have the tech. Absolutely did not have the. I mean, come on, how many people have said you know that you've seen the memes where it's like this phone? I know it's has has more computer power than all of NASA did. Back mm -hmm. in the day, and yet you know NASA NASA did what they did. Look, look, I love I love NASA as a space agency. I I think it's a great institution, you know, theoretically, but it's military from from minute one. I mean, come on, it was founded. People say, oh, it's not military. I go fine. They they wear white uniforms. They smile for the camera. They don't carry guns. They were founded from the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. Werner von Braun was the guy, right? Which right, a little yeah. hypocritical, by the way. Don't you think that um. When you're funny thing in war, if you're really, really smart, there are no war crimes. You're an asset at that point. It's like, no, nope, we're not shooting you. We're, you're going to work. You're getting a salary. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. dumb. Yeah, you, you, you're dead. Anyway, go ahead. That and NASA hired from the Air Force. So, yeah, it was military. Yeah. They're yeah again, through. Again, it, but it's brilliant in that it's the face of science. All you have to do is, you know, white uniforms, no guns, uh, you know, clean cut guy. You know, and by the way, all all the uh, the astronauts are are military officers, Air Force officers, right? In fact, I even interviewed one. I I did one. Um, oh God, what was that Piers Morgan show? Good, not was it Good Morning Britain? Was that was he he was doing? Yeah, he, been, yeah. Yeah. he 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 had one of our astronauts, Terry Verts, standing right next to him, and and you know, Piers was trying to to get a fight started. You know, calling me, he's like, are you sure you're an American? And he's going, are you calling Terry Virts a liar? And I go, no. I go, Terry Virts is an officer. He's a soldier. He's a full bird colonel in the U.S. military. Yeah. You don't get to be a colonel without knowing how to keep your mouth shut. I go, the man follows orders. I go, he could be a perfectly nice guy, but he's going to do what he's told. And, you know, Terry just kept smiling like the zombie he is. Mm. So, whatever. Yeah. Nickname is asking a question. She's a good friend of ours. She Who? says we can nickname. Nickname? That's the name is nickname. That's yeah, the nickname. <laughs> yeah, that, that's her moniker. That's yeah, all right, that's fine. That's good. I've never I've never heard that. <laughs> but uh she asks, we can see the earth curvature looking out at sea or from a plane, or what is it that creates this? Thanks. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, Neil Tyson is a wonderful video on my channel. Neil Tyson actually helped us more than he hurt us. By the way, I love the fact that there's only three media scientists, people that they put on camera in the world. One's from the U.S., Neil Tyson. Mm -hmm. One's from the U.K., Brian Cox. Yeah. And uh, one's from Japan, Michio Kaku. That's right, yeah. And the rest of and I do not count Bill Nye. Don't even bring his name up. I don't want to hear it. Science guy. Oh, <laughs> how dare you. He's so, he's so horrible. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so Neil Tyson go, does this presentation to this school because, you know, he does university lectures all the time. He never does debates. And he was talking about the Red Bull jump. And he, I, I thought it was interesting because, it, you know, he should have been towing the line, but I think his handlers can only take him so far because they want him to be authentic. And he said, you know, the Red Bull jump where, you know, the Red Bull guy went up to 130,000 feet. He jumped out of the, the balloon. And the, they used a wide-angle lens, right? And it was severely curved. But and I've talked to producers before, and and I said, why do you use that freaking image? I go, the, I go, the Earth is you, it's tiny. If that was the case, I go, and and producers came out. I said, yeah, but it's a good shot, isn't it? I go, uh, yeah, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's it's more dramatic. So Neil says that he criticizes it. and He goes, it was scientifically dishonest. He goes at one hundred thirty thousand feet. 
you can't see the curvature of the earth. He goes, no civilian will be able to see the curvature of the earth. And I go, well, that's interesting because I like nickname here. I have had thousands of people who contact me and said, oh, I've seen it from an airplane or I've seen it from the beach. And so especially airplanes, right? And I go, great. I go, take a, take a, you know, still shot of it, you know, hold some sort of, I think I've got one lying around here. Oh no. Yeah, crap. Where's my straight edge? That's yeah, around there somewhere. Anyway, hold a straight edge up to it. Tell me you see, still see the curve, right? Then send it to me. Tell, tell me you still see the curve. It's not that you see the curve. You want to see the curve. It's very Orwellian in that we're conditioned so much to see the curve that when we look out the window, like, like with anything else, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Really? Is it? Because Neil Tyson, the, the most famous scientist in the world, no, no picking on Brian Cox, um, he says that you can't. So is he wrong? Because he's got a PhD in astrophysics. He's your guy. He's your go-to. So what, and again, not picking on nickname at all. It's it's not that she sees the curvature. She wants to see the curvature. I've had people say they've seen it from balloons, from mountaintops. Um, and we're talking about the side to side here. I, I'm assuming we're not, we're not talking about the forward and back. Because the forward and back, we destroyed that immediately. Once HD, the reason why we're even talking right now is because something changed 20 years ago, which was HD technology, which was we now had the ability to put HD technology into everything from cameras to smartphones. Yeah. And, people, and, and I didn't even tell people to do it. They just started running to the beach and started shooting things off of the distance, which they couldn't do before. Because be, before, as you know, you know, boat went off of the distance. You couldn't see it anymore. Now with yeah. HD, you could you could bring that boat back into frame and mm -hmm. you keep doing it again and again and again until finally the, the thickness of the atmosphere um, was the limit. And by so, sorry if there's a follow-up question because I'm, I'm anticipating one, which is why can't you see forever? On a flat, or you know, if the Earth is flat, why can't you see? Why can't you see Japan from California? Why can't you see um, France from New York? And why can't you see Mount Everest from everywhere? Because you know, it's it's the highest place on Earth. It's like, well, if you if you were a vacuum, you probably could. I mean, in fact, in video game, in the virtual world, you can't. But because our atmosphere has a thickness to it, it gets more and more dense. It compounds over over distance. Um, especially with weather and atmospheric. I mean, this whole place was designed as, as part of the illusion, which is, you know, barometric pressure and weather and humidity and, and wind and all that fun stuff. So what I mean is the limit to human sight, even with HD cameras, seems to be between two and 300 miles. And that's in perfect conditions. So, yeah. She, sorry, nickname. You don't see it. You don't see the curve. You want to see the curve. And I get it. I get it. It's reinforcement. You've been told. I, hell, I've had air, airplane pilots tell me the same thing, which mm -hmm. is, remember, in the front, in the cockpit, it's different. In the cockpit, you're seeing a way bigger, you know, bigger sweep. And they say, oh, yeah, it looks flat. But in, a, in fact, the, the, the ones that come out, they say, yeah, it looks flat, but I know it's not, right? Because it can't be flat because it's a globe. And they, their brain tries to, to break out of the illusion. And they... and. Sometimes they can, and sometimes they can't. So, there you go. I'm trying to remember the name of that um, airplane that came out. Um, was it the Blackbird or something? Where the had um, if, if the world was um, round right, globe, it would have to keep um, like tilting its nose oh, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, two things. So the one of our spy planes, even though we don't have spy planes, we don't have spies officially which i love about spies right there is there is no spy network there are no spies but we have an intelligence network with people um the the blackbird the sr-71 which was the coolest spy plane we still use it um it went from inception to retirement basically without anyone even knowing right in fact we we it was it was so well kept a secret that we ended up um um doing like a retirement party for it where the generals are out there it's like oh yeah by the way this, this was our spy plane right and the the you're gonna have to drag me back in here in a second because i, I lost where i was but this the fsr 70 one of the retired pilots i love this he he does book tours and he like goes around and talks it's like i was an sr 71 pilot you guys want to touch me i'm cool whatever so he goes and he says hey when i was in phoenix i could see the beach of los angeles <laughs> at 70,000 feet. I'm going, okay, all right, that seems a little far. And then he would say, he would say, dog, uh, he would say, I could also see where Canada met the Rocky Mountains, where the United States met Canada. I'm going, well, that's way too far. Wow. Right. But to your point, 
the SR-71 pilot would absolutely have been in the same boat as commercial pilots, which is if you're flying over a curved surface, you either have to nose down often or you have to nose up often. And by that, I mean the faster you go, the more you have to nose down or nose up. Nose up. And I have been on I don't know, countless flights. I don't know how many flights I've been on. When you get up to cruising altitude and it is, you know, there's no turbulence, that is the smoothest ride ever. I, it is absolutely tabletop freaking flat. Nothing moves. And you know, because everything's so sensitive on the airplane, if that plane even had to dip 200 feet, you'd know it, right? And yet this plane, supposedly every, every plane has to either dip down or dip up hundreds of feet every minute uh, forever. And again, SR-71, oh my God, he'd be in a constant, constant, either nose down or nose up, depending yeah. on how you're looking at. Uh, in fact, one more thing, there's a video, I'll, I'll send it to you when we're done which is um, there was uh, one of the flight tracking systems. One of the few times I've seen this where they, they flipped it from the top down to, to the horizontal angle and showed planes going, you know, all the planes in America going up and then going level and then, and then going down, right? Which was cool in itself. Now, that's not the part that I thought was interesting. The part that I thought was interesting was because they were showing the whole United States, right? Thousands of miles from one end to the other. The United States in that model they were using was absolutely tabletop flat. Why, why would you do that? The, the raw data is curved. So why, why would you flatten it out? In fact, it would make more sense if you use curved data. But somebody either pancaked this or the raw data was flat to begin with. Mm. And again, you know, the little things. We, we miss things. That you just, the, the saying, we, uh, we can't see the forest for the trees. That's, that's the case with most people, especially pilots. Mm. So. Yeah. Um. Um, there was another thing I was looking at a while ago. It's um, when you go a flight to somewhere um, on the, the round earth, it seems to go from one point down and then back up again. But then when you put it on the flat earth, it's in a straight line. Right. Um, that was one of the things that, again, I can't remember the name of the UK guy that gave me the tip, but he, he said, look at the long haul flights. The yeah. long haul flights are anywhere in the Southern hemisphere to anywhere in the Southern hemisphere. So Africa to South America, South America to Australia, and so on and so on. He goes, watch the routes. And wow, did we find some weird stuff right off the bat. He goes, he goes first off, 90-something percent of all the flights in the Southern Hemisphere use are, are, are connecting flights. And many of them are double connection. And a whole bunch of them have to go north, up, up to the equator, and then back down. And I remember talking to it. In fact, it's the saw my channel still where there was a travel agent in the Southern Hemisphere. She goes, you don't know how lucky you guys have it. She goes, in the Northern Hemisphere, you can get nonstops from anywhere to anywhere. And this is pre-pandemic, right? Yeah. And she goes, in the Southern Hemisphere, she goes, there are capital cities, capital cities where you cannot get direct flights. You have to bounce off something else. It's, it's like it shouldn't be that far. It should just be across you know, the Southern Atlantic Ocean. It should be across the Southern Pacific Ocean. It's like, no, they take these weird arcs up north and back down. But if you overlay those flight paths on a flat Earth map, they turn into shallow dog legs or they turn into direct flights. Um, David Weiss, uh, and there's a the guy out of Korea. Uh, is it Korea? Er, crap, Japan. Uh, it's called Flat Earth, Banjo, Japan, Brazil, whatever, whatever. And he wrote this little book called, um, I think it was 16 Emergency Flights, where, again, you can only hide so much. But when there's an emergency, the flights get even weirder. I'll give you one example. So there was a flight going from the Philippines to Los Angeles, right? And a woman all of a sudden started going into labor, right, on the way. And you, you're looking at the flight path from the Philippines to Los Angeles. They're going to go straight over Hawaii, right? And it was like, Hawaii's really close. Like, oh, of course, they're going to Hawaii. No, no, no. They hung a hard left and went to Anchorage, Alaska. And it's like, look, I'm, I'm from this part of the world, right? It's like Anchorage, Alaska, there's not much there. In fact, if I had to go to a hospital, you go to Hawaii. That's where all the hospitals are, Anchorage, Alaska. We have to pay people to live in Alaska. And But when you look at it on a flat earth map, they were already next to Alaska. That's why they went there. Right. Yeah. There's certain things that the pilots, the pilots know, but nobody talks about because they got bigger, you know, other things to worry about, or they just don't want to mention it. And one of them is, yeah, when things get dicey, if you have to land, if you have to go off your flight path because of an emergency, you, they will direct you to things that do not make sense on a globe, but they make perfect sense on a flat earth. Mm. 
So there you go. And by the way, it, the, the map we're talking about, you don't even have to remember uh, as a month or equidistant, it's a mouthful. So don't just, all you have to do is look up the UN flag, which is interesting, yeah. right? So the UN flag, totally legit, right? It's That's a map projection. And, but but we say, oh no, it's the flat earth map. And they say, oh no, it's crazy. By the way, little little side note, you probably already knew this, which is the UN flag is missing one thing. What's it missing? Antarctica. Antarctica. The whole continent is missing from the UN flag. It's like, why? It's huge. It's it's as big as Australia, probably bigger. Nope. Nobody wants to. It's like, well, it's it, nobody owns it, and there's a treaty. It's like, ooh, so you're not going to put it on the on the map projection? Whatever. Yeah, it's a continent. It's a continent. It's not. It's not like the Solomons. Right? It's a whole freaking continent. And again, the the treaty makes it. Um, it's by the way, on a side little side note. It's the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. Mm. Americans, we, we make pr- treaties just to break them. That's the Indians. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> God, it's true. We do all the time. And the only unbroken treaty, and imagine making a treaty in 1959 saying that no corporation can set up shop in Antarctica and then say it's not even up for review until 2041. It's wow. like, well, yeah, that's not too far from now, right, 2041. But back in 1959, 2041, that might as well... <laughs> That's so far in the future. It's 80 years. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, we've got Nick Nimoy on the subject um, asking, what are your thoughts on Antarctica? Whoa. Why'd my camera get all fuzzy? Hang on. Stop cam. Back. Why am I fuzzy? There, that's better. There you go. I know. I hate myself on camera anyway. Uh, sorry. What, what, what are my thoughts on Antarctica? Yeah. Uh, I think Antarctica is exactly what we think it is. It's the outer marker of the world. It's the um, uh, it's the outer edge. You know, it's in, it's way way bigger than anyone thinks. It surrounds the entire thing. Uh, the only people that are allowed down there are, are scientists and military scientists, and the you know some some military. Uh, also, look up if you want to look up some cool stuff because kids ask this all the time, which is, oh, what happens to the compass in Antarctica? It doesn't do jack in Antarctica. And as you know, if you, have, you remember your, your old school magnet tricks, you know, magnet has two sides, right? You know, as the, you know, and so the earth should have a magnetic north and a magnetic south. Nobody talks about magnetic south. I've talked to Australian military that said, uh, oh, no, no, there is no magnetic south. They'll take you to what is the magnetic south, which is just this little silver post in the middle of the snow and say, oh, no, no, this is it. This, this is it. No, it doesn't do anything. All the scientists say, oh, yeah, the compass is worthless down here. Absolutely freaking worthless. So, no, Antarctica is a wonderful... Okay, I'll give you one more thing. Antarctica, you want to look up something fun? You already know this, I'm sure, uh, which is uh, Operation High Jump, which is Indiana Jones was not just a movie. During World War II, everybody left the ice that was that was doing research down there except for one group, Nazi Germany, because... It's again, it, it's absolutely like the movies in which Nazi Germany was willing to do anything to win the war, we, even if it was weird, right? So, if Harry Potter's wand was rumored to be somewhere, they're gonna go for it, right? The Ark of the Covenant, you bet they're going for it. Gollum's ring, yeah, let's find that, whatever it is. And so, if they heard there was something really mysterious happening down in Antarctica, yeah. So, when everyone else was fighting World War II, they had stuff that was down in Antarctica. That's just a matter of fact. And then right after World War II ended, once um, the Japanese signed the surrender stuff, you know, surrender papers, uh, Admiral Byrd led a full-blown carrier group with 5,000 infantry down on a scientific research mission down to Antarctica. Really? What was the big hurry? (laughs) You literally went from the surrender thing. And the rumor was that they were there to root out the last of the Nazi bases. The follow-up speculation was rampant, right? You know, all sorts of fun stuff that supposedly happened down there. What I I like the story that the the Germans asked whatever civilization was down there hanging out for asylum, and we, they the 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 group treated again. I like the rules, which is they treat it kind of like what we do with high school dances here. I don't know if you do it there, which is if you leave the dance. You can't come back, right? You're not going to drink in the parking lot and then come back to the dance. No, no, no. You're gone. You're gone. That's it. And I say this because when in 1954, when Admiral Byrd went on television, we were so lucky to get that footage um, from the CBS affiliate. When he went on television, whatever problem was happening in Antarctica was done. It was finished. 
it was cleared up. So if there was something going on, what he didn't even bring up Operation High Jump. He never really talked about it. So I think that whatever happened, they resolved it. And by 1954, it's like, nope, business as usual. And then, of course, they lock everything down. So, mm. Right. Schwabenland. Schwabenland, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? Again, I the Germans pulled no punches. Come on. If you're trying to take over the whole world, why wouldn't you go after everything that was mystical? I mean, the Thule Society, given, given you know, advisory notes? <laughs> Heck, yeah. Yeah. And the fact that the SS was the occult arm, not the... Yeah. enforcing arm <laughs> yeah. no they threw everything they had at it and i i get it look like all's fair in love and war if uh you think there's something in antarctica that can help out whatever it is i mean there's the story come on the stories go all the way back to where the only reason they they had the advantage to take on everybody in world wars because they found a roswell they had their own version of roswell in the 30s and they reverse engineered from that and the the ship didn't crash in the desert like it did in New Mexico. Here it landed like soft soft ground and was mostly intact. And they did what they did anyway. Yeah. I mean, come on, they had jet planes at the freaking end of the war. They were getting surrounded, and they're still launching jet planes. And and our guys are like, what the hell's that? Anyway, and the anti grav bell that they had. Oh yeah, dude. I, if you guys if you guys have never watched it, uh, and I'm talking to anyone who's listening, if you've never seen Man in the High Castle, watch that series. I'm, I'm surprised they made it, honestly, which was, it was based on a series of books, which was that in another timeline, Germany won the war, and here's what happened. You know, they divided the United States up in half, and Japan took the West Coast, and they took the rest. Um, little things like, uh, like, you guys remember what the Concorde is? You know, the... Yeah. Supersonic yeah. passenger jet where the, the Germans like, because we can fly supersonic. You guys, people don't know. It's like, no, we can fly really fast to places with, with people. We just don't do it because of the sonic booms. Mm -hmm. But in the show, the Germans like, who the hell cares? It's like, you can't get back time. Who cares if it's noisy? Yeah. Just freaking, you want to go from New York to Los Angeles in two hours? Absolutely, we're going to make that happen. Anyway. Um, so, do you think that Antarctica has gates and obviously the different different civilizations or remnant remnants of them? Yes, which is which would make sense be, because the, the again the Antar the Antarctic Treaty made no financial sense to anyone. That was what really what got me more than more than long distance photography, more than gravity versus the vacuum of space. It was the Antarctic Treaty, which was. Our world is based off of money and greed and power. Come on, we all know it. You know, it's corporate espionage rules are out there for a, a laws are out there for a reason. And when you seal off a country, when when Admiral Byrd goes down there and says the whole place is made out of money and people are going to be fighting over it for the next hundred years. There's oil, there's coal forever, um, there's uranium, there's minerals, there's all sorts of fun stuff. And then just a few years later, you lock all that down. And not only do you lock it down, here's the part that got me. It wasn't that you just locked it down. You made it to where no one could even talk about it, right? Mm. So, so Brit like after World War II, you know, Britain was rebuilding. And I mean, come on, British Petroleum, they, they should have been running full page ads all the time. It's like, well, how great it would be for Britain to be in Antarctica, right? They're not even allowed to broach the subject. Mm. And that just screams um, um, uh, national security. Meaning somebody went to the head of these corp corporations and said, okay, we know you want to. You can't. We're not going to tell you why. <laughs> Only that it's under the guise of national security. You don't have clearance to talk about this. And once you retire or you, you, know, you leave your position, whoever comes in, you give them this card and you have them call us. Otherwise, we're going to come back here anyway and, and tell you. Because again, imagine that every oil and gas company in the world isn't allowed to touch that place or even even protest it no country has even said oh hey you know no one's even begun to violate that treaty come on you text uh, michael you know um, if they want to start fracking in your backyard tomorrow they can do it they yeah. can make that happen right neighbors all day long right and that's not even for the good stuff and yet these same companies aren't even allowed to talk about antarctica no no, that, that screams cover up at the highest level, and which means that whatever's out there, and Cal, you, you know this, which is the, the big problem is if you let an oil and gas company in there, they have their own planes, they have their own helicopters, 
and somebody goes off course. It's going to mm. happen. Somebody goes off course and see something they shouldn't and go somewhere they shouldn't. That's a loose end you have to tie up. Yeah. How many of those loose ends do you have to tie up before all of a sudden the oil and gas company is like, hey, we're missing a bunch of people. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, and, so the, and so somebody in the Illuminati meeting is like, yeah, just shut it down. Just close it. Turn it all off. Mm-hmm. Turn it all off. We don't, nobody gets in there. It's the same thing. It's the bigger version of why there was no um, stars during the Apollo program, yeah. which is people are, they were trying to work out the math. And it's like, you know, because again, if, if the star constellations are in the wrong spot, some nerd's going to catch it. They're going to find it. It's like Belt of Orion shouldn't be there. It's, di- it's date stamped. It shouldn't be there. Right. And then it's over. So somebody says, no stars, no stars, just freaking no stars. And what gets me now is like Artemis. You know, we're doing the new the new moon program. Artemis, look it up if you get a chance. Yeah. Artemis, you know, supposedly went around the moon just recently, this year. Yeah. Was within, what, 50 miles? No stars anywhere. And I'm going, okay, fine. 1969, you want to say it's an exposure setting? Fine. But this is 2023, folks. We got cameras on top of cameras on top of cameras. We have digital technology that rivals the gods, right? It's better on our own eyesight. And yet you're going you're gonna to tell me you went to the moon and back with hundreds of hours from multiple angles and no stars. So basically there's no stars in space. Fine. Fine. Sure. General public's dumb. Don't believe it. Sorry. <laughs> what else you got? Any more questions? I, no, I mean, probably, but I can't think of any at the moment. No? <laughs> can't believe I, it. Mm. <laughs> We usually sit and talk about this for hours as well. So I know. I, I look. There, there's there's a lot of ground to cover, and and I know your audience is probably. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Um, when we did behind the curve the documentary, I sat in with some of the studio audiences in, in different film festivals, and most of them didn't even think it was real. Didn't even think it was a real movie until like 30 minutes in. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally thought it was like a parody movie, and then all of a sudden, once they realized that it's like, wait, wait, these people are talking serious. Like it's a thing. It's a, there's something on the internet. I did not even know it was there. By the time the the movie ended, they were so overwhelmed that they just had questions and questions and questions and questions. So, for anybody that's out there, that again, first off, do not take my word for it. Everything I just said during this whole thing, take it with a grain of salt, because I'm not here to convince you. I'm not here to persuade you. I'm here to just put ideas into your head and let them rattle around like a marble in a paint can. You will have to figure this out for yourself. Do your own research. Mm-hmm. Uh, ask questions and and figure this out on your own because you're the one the reason why our retention rate is so high you know we've got like a 99 percent retention rate which is ridiculous um because once you're in you're in it's very very matrixy red pilly mm. it, 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 the reason is because you, <coughs> you tore down the globe we didn't tear it down and if you tore it down how are you going back you know the the line from from cypher in the matrix which is you know, ignorance is bliss. You know, why did, why did, why, why didn't I take the blue pill? Right. So, which, is, which is what I'll, I'll leave you with, which is look, there's, if you get up every morning and look, everything is awesome, thumbs up and life is great. Don't do it. And that's not reverse psychology. Mm-hmm. I'm serious. Don't do it. Because if you go down this road, there is a point of no return. And if, once you get to that point, eventually you're going to send me emails. And I, I, again, it's all, in fun where they'll say you know you ruined my life you know i've only gotten like one death threat ever and the guy was on a meth vender but oh <laughs> and, and, and i'm pretty sure he was from your neck of the woods because he said he was going to stab me with a 24 centimeter knife and wow. and it's like it's like i don't we don't do metric so i'm going i'm no. trying to do it's like so what is that it's like, like nine inches eight inches nine inches <laughs> and, and 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 then i thought he said why well, he I, he apologized he said he was hitting the glass and I, I don't know anything about drugs. And so I go, oh, so you were doing crack, right? Oh, hitting and, the glass, that means he was drinking? No, no. he Hitting the glass hit, hit is, no, you're right, in the UK, could also be drinking. But over here, hitting the glass means meth. Oh. Right, we, we don't really have meth over here. Not really. Not, well. Not like that, anyway. No. Yeah. Well, anyway, he was on a meth bender and he apologized, but whatever. It was like, it's like you're you're his, his real email. It's like, why would you stab me? Anyway, so my point is, is like, don't, don't look at it just casually. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll get to this point. There'll be this weird aha moment where once you, once it clicks in, then you're, everything looks different. 
everything. You will you will look at every conspiracy that you ever thought of differently, and then you'll wonder. Then you'll be like, "Is anything true? Anything?" <laughs> well, then you'll find it fall down that like little rabbit hole. Mm. Yeah, just never ending. Yeah, no, nobody climbs out of this one. It's uh, it's it's really really tough. But again, only because the again everybody hates it, including me. It took me nine months. Uh, it may take some of the people listening two weeks. May take them two months. Uh, the longer the longer you stare at it, the worse it gets. Sorry. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, it's got to that uh, hour thirty minutes, so we're gonna have to wrap it up here, unfortunately. But it's been really really interesting been amazing talking to you and hearing everything that you've got to say anyway um if anybody wants to find you not to give you death threats so where can they find you don't don't find me <laughs> don't look for me I promise uh, address I is... <laughs> no no the, the, the easiest way okay yeah if you want to threaten me with a 24 centimeter blade uh <laughs> contact michael at uh <laughs> The um, no, 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 I, you know, what I, I don't, I'm not going to give out the, the I'll, I'll give you two things really quick. Um, the, the first thing is, uh, look up the, the app, answers a, a bunch of questions. It's, it's called the Flat Earth, Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app. It's wonderful. I didn't develop it, I don't get a dime for it, but it's our, it's our official app and it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm on it, but if you want to find me, uh, the easiest way to go down the rabbit hole is just type in Flat Earth Mark into any search engine and just. See where it takes you. I honestly don't know where it's going to take you. Well, I found you easy enough, so. There, yeah, there you go. I mean, I put I put all my contact information out there. My email address is out there. My phone number, my real physical address, uh, all all that stuff. And I do it deliberately. It's like, well, one because I'm a guy. You know, women never ever ever do that. Never, never. Unless um, crazy. Oh my god, <laughs> men, are, men are horrible. Like, yeah, if if Kel decided to put her, her phone number out there, she'd have drunk dials almost immediately. You know, three in the morning to be like, hey, you seem kind of pretty. That's all right. I'm used to that. As I told you, what my job used to be. So, oh yeah, <laughs> that yeah. All the time. <laughs> bad. So, um, yeah, that's it. Type in flat Earth Mark and and see where it takes you. And I, I hope your journey is mostly peaceful. Uh, don't. But again, the first rule, which you guys know, which is in the the clues, which is first rule of Flat Club is do not talk about Flat Club. If you get into Flat Earth, do not start talking about it with your friends. Don't do it. And again, that's not reverse psychology. That is, don't don't be that guy because otherwise, especially at work, otherwise you're going to be that flat Earth guy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the crazy one, apparently. Anyway, uh, my only request is, uh, whenever you post this, I'd love a link to it. And if you have access to the audio, uh, I'd, I'd I'd love a copy. Yeah, Michael, I'm sure we could sort that out. I I can get it to Kel, and Kel can get it to you, or. Okay. If you put your email in private chat, I can you know what? I will get do it over for you here. I'll, I'll type it in right now. Mar M Sergeant twenty three at Comcast dot net. Please send audio or links or both and naked pics. There we go. <laughs> I actually typed that in. By the yes, way. he did. Yeah, I did. I'm looking right at that. <laughs> what? I'm single. I can get away with that. I'm not. I'm not on Tinder. Do you guys? Have, do you guys have Tinder over there? Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I I could totally send him mole rats. He never declared what naked pics he wanted. <laughs> naked mole rats. Naked nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Anyway, anything else I can do? I, I can do for you guys. No, that's it. Um, but uh, like I say, um, hopefully in the future we can get you back on again if you would be okay to do that. Yeah, uh, I don't think so. It's a one. It's a one-time deal. Uh, no, it's fine. You absolutely <laughs> just let me know. I, I'm more than happy to uh, to do it. Brilliant. So thank you. Just, it's been a pleasure be... having you on. Anyway. Yeah. No. Thank you, guys. I, I appreciate. It. I love. I love, honestly, I love doing anything that's tied to the UK. I I I did not know. Anything about it? And I fell in love with it when uh, when I was over there. So. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ever come over here, just give away a shout. We'll show you around. Oh, awesome! Very very cool. No problem. So <laughs> anyway, we're going to say good night uh, and thanks to everybody that put any comments in and um, thanks to Matt for asking a load of questions and thanks to Michael for being quiet for a change so we could go good night. Shut up, Michael! My God. <laughs> He's not usually this quiet, you know. <laughs> but 
But um, yeah, um, so we'll, I guess we'll see you next week. And um, Michael, I'll let you end close the show. All right. Thank well, you. thank you to the chat group. Thank you, everyone. And have a blessed day. Long Thank you for joining us at Paranormal Versus. Hope to see you on our next episode. Hello, Maggie.